Shalak, Yeshu Ansari. Amar Did he want to go to the cross? Well, from a human viewpoint, he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. Did he trust his father to take him through the cross and out the other side? Absolutely. Did he trust that the shame would only be temporary only for a little while on earth, culminating in his horrible death on the cross? Absolutely. He believed God would take him through that cross, out the other side of the grave, and set him at his right hand in heaven. That's faith. That's faith that faced a crisis the likes of which no human being has ever faced except him. That's how great his faith was. Jesus lived a life of perfect obedience. In fact, even at the cross you see that. When he's on the cross and God had forsaken him and turned his back on him, Jesus cries out to God, my God, my God, not cruel father. He didn't change his name for God. He says, my God, He's still faithful to God. In fact, he says, not my will, but yours be done. Even in the hour of death, after having been forsaken by God, Jesus was loyal to the Father. You see, Jesus lived the life that I should have lived. And then he died the death that I was supposed to die. Why? Why did Jesus have to go through this? And why did it have to be so bloody? People hate the blood of gross. And that's the point. Blood grosses you out, your sin grosses God. God made it bloody. He left it in there. He left the record of us so that we could understand it, so that you would have a sense of the sinfulness of sin. What you're looking at when you look at that bloody, torturous crucifixion of Christ is not pleasant. It is not supposed to be. Your sin, that offends you. Your sin offends God in the same way. The cross shows us the sinfulness of our sin. You deserve to be condemned. And I'm not saying that. In fact, I need you to hear me out to the end. But you can't understand the love of God or the forgiveness or the holiness of God until you understand that the cross of Jesus is what Jesus did in your place. You see, we like to think of ourselves as basically good people. You look at the cross and tell me what heaven's verdict is about you. Some intense words to hear. Because you see, today is a day where we look at the cross of Jesus. And you know what saddens me is many people look at it as a fairy tale. Many people look at it as a pastime story. As something in history that happened and doesn't impact our lives today. But it's something that, that impacts the very fabric of who you are. And that's something you've got to understand. You can't just go and look at the cross and go, oh, shame Jesus, poor Jesus. No. We cannot comprehend, we cannot begin to fathom what our sinfulness has done to God. We cannot begin to even grasp 
how much it, it hurt God to see His children turn out the way they did before the cross of Christ. Come on, He created us perfect. The very image of God. And in comes pride. In comes one stupid decision. Why? Because of me. I want what I want, and I want it now. And it changed every single thing. Throughout Old Testament, you can read in and out. Israel comes to God. Israel turns away from God. Israel is judged. They repent. It's the sixth cycle over and over and over again. They bring their sacrifices. Their sins are washed away. But just once a year, it's washed away. It's not taken away. It's not destroyed. It's not, it's, it stays there. And that is why the cross is so beautiful. Because it changes things. You see, the most scariest part of the gospel that I can tell you today is the fact that God is a good God. And you go like, but why is that scary? Why is that a problem? Because we are bad people. And you know what the problem is? We don't realize we're bad people. Ons kyk TV en ons kyk nies en ons gaan, jy's die ouwe is bad. Jy's ons president is bad. Jy's kyk hierdie ouwens op Facebook wat mense doodmaak in die plaasmoor. Hulle is bad. But do you know that you deserve the exact same condemnation as, and death as what they do? Do you know we all deserve the exact same hell as everyone else? There's nothing that separates us from the murderous guy or the guy that, that raped you or the guy that hurt you or the guy that, that did something to you. There's nothing that separates us from him except the love of God and the grace of God. And it's not that God favors us above that person. No, it's just the fact that you were blessed enough to sit in a church service or to be at one place at a single time in your life where you encountered the grace of God and it changed everything. And if it hasn't changed everything and you prayed the sinner's prayer, you are not saved sitting in this place today. And I will tell it to you straight. You see, we've reduced Christianity, we've reduced salvation to a, to a simple prayer that we pray in church. We raise our hand, oh Lord Jesus, please save me. And then we think, okay, I'm going to heaven. You are fooling yourself. You see, if that day when you decided to give it all to Jesus, if that day doesn't change the very fabric of who you are, it doesn't change the very nature of your life from something bad into something else, into something new, then you are not saved. Then go home today and question your salvation. If you are the same or you are worse today than you were yesterday, go home and question your salvation. Well, I'll be, I'll be frank, you don't need to go home, you can question it right now, because today I'm going to give you a chance to really be saved, if you haven't yet. You see, I want you to see the fullness of the cross today. I want you to see the fullness of what God has done. And the problem is, in light of the cross, in light of God's holy standards, we fall short. Romans 3 verse 12 says, all have turned away, all have become useless. How's that for, for making you feel better on a good Friday? All have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one. Even in Luke, someone called Jesus good and he said, Why do you call me good? I am not good. Only the Father is good. Jesus himself, God in flesh, passing on the glory and saying, I'm not good. But look at us. We pat ourselves on the shoulders on a regular basis. Ooh, well done. I get, I get for my Frau sex, Lifa. That makes me a good husband. No? <laughs> I get for iemand gesê, Jesus is Lifa. Lief, that makes me a good Christian. No? Nothing makes you good. In fact, the Bible says our righteousness, our own personal righteousness are like filthy menstrual rags before the Lord. The best of the best of the best of your efforts this is like filthy rags. We can't do it. We are inherently sinful. 
and saying, John, do you just have bad news today? No, I've got good news. I'm getting to the good news. But I need you to see the problem before we can understand the solution. <laughs> Romans 3 verse 23 says, Since all have sinned and continually fall short of the glory of God. Come on, that's something. We think all have sinned and for once we just fall short. But continually without Jesus, every single day you, fall, you will fall short of the glory of God. And that's why I can say, but God, but God decided to do something. He looked at our sinfulness in his pain, in his hurt. He looked at us and went, even though you are so sinful, I still want you. Does he need you? No, he's a self-sustaining God. Our Jesus is not a pansy that, that needs us. Come on, many of us turn Jesus into this person of God needs us. He longs for us to be in his life. He longs for us to be part of his kingdom. Nonsense. God is a self-sustaining God. He's the creator of heaven and earth. Everything that you see is God. He doesn't need any one of us. But he wants us. That's what makes the biggest difference. He wants us. And that's why He sent His Son to become God in the flesh, to become human, to become one of us. Come on, every other single religion, whether you're a Jehovah's Witness, whether you're a, an atheist, whether you're an Islam, whether you're Muslim, whether you're Buddhist, no matter what, even atheists believe that in some certain way they have to contend to be good. Every single religion believes that I have to work my butt off to get into heaven one day. That we have to climb the mountain to God. Our religion, which is actually a relationship, our God decided to come down from the mountain and to be with His children, to be with His people. You see, this is truly a day in history that changed everything. In fact, it changed everything so much that it even changed the dates from before Christ to after Christ. They tried and wiped it away now to make it before common era, BCE, whatever, man. It was before Christ and after Christ. Christ is the divide in time, from a time where there was wrath to a time where there's grace freely given. But how we spit in the face of grace with the way we treat it. But in the moment Jesus died, something powerful happened to you and me. Something we cannot describe in words, something we cannot understand with our minds, but something powerful happened. What was it? Let's read John 19 verse 28 to 30. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch and held it up held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, It is finished. And then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. See, those words mean a lot. And, and those of you guys that went with to the Passion Conference, we heard about the whole thing, it is finished. And that's what inspired me to talk of this today. Because it's something that we've got to grip. It's something that we've got to understand. Those three words, it is finished, is one word in Greek. It's tetelestai. And it is, it is a, an amazing word. It's a servant's word. Back in the day, a servant who was a slave to his master, when he had a job to accomplish, and he was finished with his job, he went back to his master and he said, tetelestai, it is finished. It is completed. It was a priestly word. Used in the Old Testament when they did their sacrifices and they atoned for the people's sins. They paid the price. They, they spread the blood. They splattered it on the, on the Ark of the Covenant. Then the priest would go, Tetelestai. It is finished. The sacrifice is accepted. It is perfect. It is used from art, an artist's perspective. They used it back then. In a, if an artist finished his painting, he finished his masterpiece. He went, Tetelestai. It is finished. It's a merchant's word. 
for people back then that, that traded to and fro with, with merchandise and money and slavery. And when this debt was paid in full, when this merchant paid his debt completely and there was nothing left to pay, he uttered the words, Tetelestai, it is finished. It's paid in full. Warriors used it in battle when they fought the good fight and the battle was done and they were victorious. The soldier would run back to his general and in that moment, he would say, Tetelestai, and the general would know it is finished. The battle has been won. Do you see the beauty of this word? It is finished. The price is paid in full. And you know what the awesome word of this word is in Greek? It means it's completed once and for all. And its results are abiding continuously. So it's something that's done once and for all. And the results abide continuously. It keeps going. He's finished. His last few words, his last moments, his last breath on the cross, his death was where our life began. Where his life ended, our life started. And it's such an unfair exchange. Because God says, give me, give me all your brokenness. Give me all your sin. Give me everything that messes you up. And I will give you all of me. I will give you my righteousness. I will give you my holiness. So let's quickly look at what, what is finished. There's four things I want to focus on. The first thing that was finished when Jesus said it is finished is the system. The world system, the religious system was finished. You see, in the Old Testament, it was a works-based thing. They, they still had faith, but there was a lot of works based to their faith. They had to do sacrifices. They had to obey over 600 laws. And if you flaw in one, you get stoned, baby. No, no questions asked. You don't even get a trial sometimes. It's just like, I saw you, bring the counsel, bring the stones, game over. It was a very strict and rigid religion. But nevertheless, they kept pure to their religion most of the time. And we have grace freely. And we live in worse ways than they. But God said it is finished. The system is finished. He meant that religious system. Jesus was and is the final sacrifice for all people of all times. Past, present, future. Black, white, Hispanic, Italian, Chinese, Japanese, all people, all times, past, present, and future. Come on, I even make the mistake sometimes. I say, you know, if Jesus could do it again, he will all for you. That's rubbish. We, we make light the price that God has paid. Why? Because all of a sudden when I say Jesus will do it again for you, I'm saying that, listen, dude, your price that you paid is not good enough. Because I consider that maybe someday you'll have to do it again. Come on, it's something we say often to make people feel better. But it's so unbiblical. Why? Because the Bible says he paid once and for all. Hebrews 10 verse 11 to 14 says, Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest, Jesus, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. No more system. No more you have to work your way to God. Does that mean I sit and do nothing? No. The good that God does in you produces good works. But you don't work to earn God's grace. Come on, and so many times it gets us. Because now all of a sudden you're far away from God. How do you try and come back? And we try and earn our way back. 
We try all of a sudden and do things a lot better, or we try and do new things. Come on, most of the stuff that we need to do to fix things, to come back to God, to fix our families, to fix our relationships, to fix our, our marriages, let's go down on your knees and pray. Then people will mock me and say, I'm doing nothing. Oh no, they don't have a clue. They can mock as much as they want. But you are praying to the high priest, the intercessor that stands between us and God. You cannot fix your marriage with a religious system. You cannot fix your household with a list of do's and don'ts. You cannot fix your life with a list of do's and don'ts. You cannot be good enough to fix anything you need. Jesus, because He is good, He's the only good one, He's the perfect one, and He's the only one that can change everything once and for all. Why? Because He's paid the price, and He has all the right to come into your life and say, it is finished. The price is paid, and it's good enough. You see, now it's not anymore about what we can do to become good, but it's about our Savior, all about Him, who has already made us right with God. He's already paid the price. You see, the systems are over and there's no more making ourselves good for God because Jesus comes and He makes you good. Not so that we can boast and say we are good people. No, so that we can boast and glory in the grace of God, saying that by His grace, I am saved. D.L. Moody, he's a great man of God. You can go and Google him and read some of his books. He one day rode on a passenger train, and the engineer heard of this guy, and, and this great man of God is on my train, man. So this guy thinks, yeah, I'm going to get him. He's going to sit next to me for the whole ride. So he sent his conductor to ask him if he wants to ride up in front of the train with him. And, and D.L. Moody thought, yeah, this is good. I'll do this. Sat with the conductor and the engineer, and the whole time, next to this engineer, when they began to talk, Moody was getting an earful of what a good person this man was. And how he would go to heaven because of keeping holy rituals and the Ten Commandments. So this guy keeps on going on and on and saying, I'm such a good person. You know, I do all the Ten Commandments. And he's trying to impress this guy. He's trying to impress this man of God. And this guy silences him. And I love what he says. He says, sir... Allow me to explain the difference between your way to heaven and the Bible's. He says, you spell salvation, do. God spells it, done. Tetelestai. It is finished. Man, that's so powerful. The second thing that is finished is the wages of sin. You see, sin makes us dead people. That's the problem is, is everyone wants to go on about how bad I was in my past. I could drugs gedoen and I could dit gedoen and I could die gedoen and I could dat gedoen. Doesn't matter. All of us, whether you were really bad or slightly bad or just a little less bad than the other guy, all of us were dead. Every single one of us. So if you tell me I don't have a story to tell someone because I don't have this long list of failures in my past and bad stuff that I, that I did, you've got a story. Why? Because you were dead. Nada. There was nothing. You were going to hell. And in comes Jesus. And He makes the dead people alive. See, the issue is not the sin. The issue is are you alive or are you dead? And that's a question you need to ask yourself today. Are you alive or are you dead? Because the problem is, I look at most of Christians today, man, you can put them in a casket and close it. Or hand them a razor blade to fasten the process. Because so many of us are so downcast, so depressed, when people look at you, they go like, man, why are you a Christian in the first place? Where is God? He's such a good God. Why are you always so negative? Why are you always looking like the world? Why are you always moaning and groping and complaining about everything? You're just as dead as the next guy. Where's Jesus? Are you alive today? Or are you dead? And that's something you've got to think of. Because many of us think that we're alive. Because once upon a time, we prayed a prayer. But we are not living the life of the living. 
We are living the life of the dead. You smell like them. You look like them. You sound like them. Nothing's changed. Then you truly want to tell me that you're alive in Christ? No, no, you're alive in your own mind. But you are dead to Christ. Think about it. Can people see any difference in you than what they see in the world? Can they see that there is life and there is not just sin? I'm not saying we need to be perfect. No. Far from it. We can never be perfect. Mark challenge you vandag. Hoe anders is jou baie klap as die rest van die klaps al buite? Drink en syp en rook en gaan jy te keer as die rest van hulle of like jy anders? Vloek jy soos die rest van hulle of like jy anders? Rebeleer jy tegen die government soos die rest van hulle of like jy anders en stel die voorbeeld? En nie net bikers nie, amal wat jy sê. Like jy anders? Reik jy anders? Klink jy anders? But you know what? To be dead stinks. Beloof jou, grave graf oop and you'll smell, man. Nie dat ek het al gedoen het nie, but I can just imagine. <laughs> but think of it. Jesus calls this the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and these are the, the guys that were the religious elect. They were the best of the best. He calls them, you are a bunch of whitewashed tombs. On the outside, you're so pretty and white and pearly, but on the inside, you stink. The problem with us is, we don't even bother anymore to look good on the outside. We just blend in with the crowd. Come on, couples live together before they marry. Couples have sex together before they marry. We look at pornography as if it's nothing. We cuss and swear as if it's nothing. We join in on the fun of the world as if it's nothing. We think God is okay with it. No, He's not. He killed that sin in your life. He came so that you can live free from it all. Why? Because that puts you in a place of bondage. God never said sin is over because I want your life to be boring. No, sin is over because I want you to truly live. Because sin kills you, man. It might feel good in the moment. Five minutes of pleasing yourself might be awesome in the five minutes. But Jesus says himself, cut off your hand if it causes you to stumble because that hand and whatever it can give you is not worth you, your whole body being condemned in hell. Cut off, make the sacrifices. Because we are living in a world that needs to see radical believers rise up and be the difference. We are living in a world that is going to dust and they need to see Jesus inside of us. And they don't just see Jesus by you just carrying on and speaking Jesus. Because that's easy. They see Jesus when you live Jesus. See, the wages of sin is finished. Jesus left heaven. He stepped onto earth to bring us back to life. The payment of sin is death. Romans says it. He says the wages of sin is death. And ha- that happened right then and there on the cross. The wages of sin, that death, came to Jesus. Physically and spiritually. Because he had a moment where he was totally separated from God. When he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He experienced hell in that moment. See, Romans 5, verse 6 to 8 says this in the message. Christ arrives right on time to make this happen. He didn't and doesn't wait for us to get ready. He presented himself for this sacrificial death when we were far too weak and rebellious to do anything to get ourselves ready. And even if we hadn't been so weak, we wouldn't have known what to do anyway. We can understand someone dying for a person worth dying for. And we can understand how someone good and noble could inspire us to selfless sacrifice. But God put His love on the line for us by offering His Son in sacrificial death while we were of no use whatever to Him. Come on, other translations calls us enemies of God. Why we were still enemies, He died for us. Come on, how many of you hate people? You have enmity in your heart towards people. Man, you wish you could kill someone. God didn't wish that. His holiness and His wrath would have killed us in the end 
If he didn't step in and paid the price. And he did it while we were still his enemies. Not his children. You see, death is real. And we'll all have to cross death one day. Physically. But spiritual death is removed from us by the cross. It is finished. Sin made you dead, but Jesus gave you life. And if he hasn't yet, he can give you life. The third thing is the fact that shame was finished. Shame is over. Shame, guilt, everything is finished. And that's the problem is the devil loves to come and play the guilt card in our minds. He loves to come and tell us how guilty, how filthy, how shameful you should be. He loves it. Because as much as we stay in that position of guilt and shame, we will not be able to connect with God. You see, and here is, is the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 6 verse 7. And, and he gets this vision where he's like in the throne room of God. And you know what the first thing is that happens? Is it's so holy, it's so amazing, it's so intense in that presence. That man drops to his face. And he's like, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips and I come from unclean people just kill me now. I'm dead. I'm done for. I'm gone. He realized in that moment how horrible his sin is towards God. He realized in that moment how, how, how great his disposition was towards Jesus and that he couldn't come close. And in that moment when he fell down before God, an angel flew to him with a coal in his hands, and it says in Isaiah 6 verse 7, he touched my lips with it and said, see this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Your guilt and your shame is finished. You need to stop letting the the past define you. You need to stop letting your failures define you. You need to stop letting what other people say about you define you. Because negative words from people outside cannot make you who you are. The doctor telling you you have cancer cannot define you. The fact that you went through horrible situations that you cannot even utter in words cannot define you. Why? Because there is one word that defines you, and it's the word tetelestai. It is finished. That's the words that need to define you. So when shame and guilt comes, and when the devil comes to put you on this guilt trip, you know what you can do? You can take him back to the cross, and you can say, it is finished. I don't need to listen to this nonsense. When someone comes to you and and says, listen, this is your past, how can you stand here and preach? Come on, I'm one of those. I'm not supposed to stand here, but you know what? The cross said it is finished, and by God's grace, I can preach the gospel. And you can do the same. You need to do the same. It's not just pastors that need to preach. Every single one of you need to preach with your lifestyle and the way that you live. Why? Because God has called us to be ambassadors in His kingdom. Not just to sit around and loaf while the battle is taking place so that you can get a, a get out of hell free card one day and, and just make it to heaven. That's the problem is most of us will make it to heaven one day and that's it. No reward, no nothing, no well done my good and faithful servant. It's just going to be heaven. And some of us go like, well, that's, that's not too bad. I promise you, when you get up there and you realize what you could have accomplished for the kingdom of God and for His cross and for His love and the price that He paid, You will regret it for the rest of eternity. Stop living with just enough to get by. Get out of that illegitimate relationship because it's killing you. Be radical. If you live together before you're married, be radical. Move out. Or live in total opposite rooms or get someone to live with you in the house to make sure you guys can stay accountable and peer towards one another. If you had sex before marriage, it's not too late. Be radical. Change it. Don't even sit in a room together if you know that's going to tempt you. If you are a married man and you've fallen into pornography, be radical. Throw away your computer if you have to. And your cell phone. Because that kind of radical living will show the world out there that our God is real. See, the world doesn't believe in a God. Or in the one and only God. Why? Because they don't see Him in us. We disprove our faith by everything that we say and do. Come on, Jesus is being shortchanged. 
for the price that he paid. His grace was free, yes. He gives it to you as a free gift. But by no means was his grace cheap so that you can just live the life you wanted to. And that brings me to the last point. And this is probably the most painful one. When Jesus said, it is finished, he said, self is finished. So you can't just go like, amen, the system is done. Amen, sin is done. The power of death is gone. Amen, like the guilt and the shame is gone. But you cannot give yourself completely over to Jesus. Major Ian Thomas made this statement. Man, I listened to a video and this guy struck me right to the very core. And he made this statement. He said, Jesus didn't die upon the cross just to get you out of hell and into heaven. He died upon the cross to get God out of heaven and into you. Actually calling the shots in your life. Actually controlling what you do with your hands. Actually controlling where you go with your feet. Actually controlling what you say with your lips. Actually controlling what you think with your mind. Actually controlling the decisions you make. And that is the measure in which you are saved. It's a total submission. It's a total give over to Jesus. But you know what a lot of us do? This is our sin and there's the cross. And we're like, I'm, I'm almost there, God. Just, just give me some time. Like, you can have that part of me so long. Come on, when we come to Jesus, it's a total submission. And we give everything over to God. Come on, Paul himself, when he saw the cross, he said, I am I'm undone. The rest of my life, I'm living for the single purpose, and it is to know the grace of God and to spread the grace of God. And he left everything he knew because of Jesus. Come on, if you're not willing to give it all, you haven't truly met Jesus. Jesus needs to be in control, the centerpiece of your life. He needs to be the decision factor in everything you do. Why? Because he owns everything. Come on, how many of us before we go on vacation, ask Jesus where he wants us to go on vacation. No, it's my luxury. No, it's not. How many of us, before we buy something, ask Jesus how he would like us to spend our money? How many of us, before we move to another neighborhood or before we, for that ons verhuis, hoeveel van ons bid actually en vraag, Heere, waar wil jy moet ek bly? No, because we move because of finances. We move because of yeah, this area is a bit dangerous and dodge. Have you ever thought for a moment that maybe that's right where God wants you? Because in the darkest places, His light can shine the brightest. Nobody Bible say, ons moet walk in bed. Watch and pray and be careful so that you don't fall into temptation. Not watch and pray so that, so that you think foot electric fence op jou huis kan sit, so dat die mens nie kan inkom nie. A lot of us live like Christian atheists. We have a God that can give us everything. He believe, He promises us provision, He promises us safety, He promises us security, He promises us health, but we live as if none of that, those things are promised to us. We depend on our salary, we depend on our security systems, and then we go like, oh yes, hoe kom hier het nie gewerk nie? because it's your own efforts and it's like filthy rags before the Lord. It's time we man up and woman up and live like Christians. Live like men and women of God that give Him everything. Why should I ask God where to go to on vacation? Because maybe there's someone in that destination that will never get a chance to hear the gospel the way that you can share it with them. I read a picture throughout the week. It said that you are only blessed with another day because someone in this world needs you. Not because you are blessed enough to have another day. And that's exactly that. We are on this earth, not for ourselves. So stop living for yourself because you, never, you will never be fulfilled. No amount of sex, no amount of drugs, no amount of alcohol, no amount of cigarettes, no amount of anything will satisfy because everything and anything done to please self is worthless. We need to live our life sacrificially. Who did let me relax? Have you ever tried Jesus? Have you ever tried to really seek His face in worship and 
pray and say, God, give me peace for the situation. No, because jy is te vinnig om my pakkie te grijp. Jesus staan nie as een kans nie. Ja, maar, ja, maar dis nie een dikse nie. If you can't say no to it, it's controlling you. And Jesus isn't controlling you. Anything in your life that supersedes the will of God in your life is controlling you over Jesus. And we need to get to a place where Jesus can control us. Self is finished. I love the statement that Mary Montgomery made. He says, Jesus didn't die on a cross so that we don't have to. He died on a cross to show us how. It brings me to the scripture in Galatians 2 verse 20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. That is, in Him, I have shared His crucifixion. Not I skip the crucifixion part and just live the good life. I share in His crucifixion. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith, by adhering to, relying on, and completely trusting in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself up for me. You see, we're ending today, we're ending up with our eyes on Jesus and celebrating that He gave up His rights so that we could become children of God. Come on, as I statement from the one man's dood is the other man's brood, it could never be more true than for us. Because the death of our God, the death of our King has given us life and we make light of it by how we live and what we do. And it's time that we rise up as the children of God. You see, His death right became our birth right and everything we have is because of Him alone. Every single thing. You are alive another day because of Jesus, not because of the fact that you are gymming every day and eating healthy. You are alive another day because God gives you the gift of life. You have a job because God provided it. If you don't have a job, it's also a situation that God places you in to build your character and to build your faith. And you will sit in that jobless position until you realize that and start thanking God for His grace and His provision. You have a marriage that's working today, if you have one, because of Jesus. You have what you have because the king who owns everything has decided to give you a portion of it. Come on, we, we chase after wealth Just think of it, one ruby on his robe is more expensive than anything in this whole world, than all the world's finances put together. He holds it all in his hands. And he made it available to us by stretching out his arms on that cross and saying, this blood is for you. Not one drop spilt by accident. Every single drop shed on purpose. And my question to you today is, what are you doing with that blood? Are you truly living in such a way that the words, it is finished, resonates in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit? Or are you still trying to complete the work that God has already done? Or are you running away from the finished work of Jesus? in different situations in your life. Think about it. Because it is finished. The price has been paid. All you need to do is open your heart and say, God, I want to meet you. I want to give my life over to you. And He brings the power to change, to become the person He's called you to be. But he can't do that if you don't submit. Say, God, take my everything. Take my all. Help me to become the son or the daughter that you've called me to be. Help me to live in the power of the telestai. It is finished. Let's close our eyes. God, I pray that you would come today 
and you would work in our hearts. I pray that we would truly realize what those words on the cross meant when you shouted out, it is finished. And I pray there where we are stuck in sin, where we are stuck in a life of perpetual shame and guilt, I'm not going to ask anyone to raise a hand because it's not about the hand. It's about your heart. So there where you are, in your heart, I'm going to beg you, if you haven't met with Jesus, open your heart to Him today. Open your heart and say, Jesus, I need you. With all, all sincerity, say, Jesus, I want you in my life. I submit myself and realize today that the system is gone, it's done, it's finished. Realize today that the death that belonged to you is finished. Realize today that the guilt and the sin and the shame is finished. And then also realize today that self is finished. It's not about me anymore. It's about Jesus and His glory and His kingdom. And God, I pray that we will wake up to that truth to know that it's all about you, not about us. Every single thing belongs to you. Come and have your will and your way in us, Lord. Change us and mold us to become the people you've called us to be. Challenge us, Holy Spirit. Convict us of areas in our lives that still offend you, of things in our life that still make you sad and hurt you, God. Help us to live in such a way that will bring you glory that will bring you honor and that will bring you praise. Help us to look entirely different from the world out there. Help us to smell different, to sound different. Help us to be the solution to this darkness that we face in our world. As the world gets darker, help us, God, as your children, to shine brighter than ever before. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.